if anyone knows me well at all, it's that they know I enjoy a good ghost story. Whether it's folklore, myths, legends, you name it. I've got to go around Scotland because as far as I'm aware, every country has gotten a few tales to tell. So that's what I'm going to be doing just now. A few places around about Scotland which have a good legend behind it. Whether it's uh, something to do with the actual place itself or that's where it originated. That's where I'm going to be heading. If I'm brave enough, guys. I've arrived in Turriff, which has the legend of the Turriff cow, or in Doric known as the Turraku. Now the cow back in the 1910s uh, was made famous because of a dispute between the farmers and the government who ensued this new tax. There was a protest over taxes and national insurance. They brought this national insurance tax in, which became comp uh, compulsory for workers between the ages of 16 and 70. Of course, because uh, the tax was brought in, there was a lot of protests by a lot of marts, a lot of farmers, and one farmer in particular, by the name of Robert Patterson, uh, refused to stamp the insurance cards of his employees. Uh, Patterson was charged under the National Insurance Act and had to pay £15, plus the arrears of the national insurance contributions. He paid the fine, but he didn't pay the, um, the arrears, and therefore the government decided to make up for it, they took away his only property, which was his milk cow, or the fight coup. When this happened, a good hundred protesters, maybe more, started pelting rotten fruit and soot at the, uh, the offers and government officials because they were taking away this cow. The cow was then taken to Aberdeen, where it was sold for seven pounds. The local community had uh, bonded together to raise funds to buy the cow back. And then the cow was paraded through the streets of Turriff in 1914, and it was a big public event. The cow was then returned to the Partisans farm, where it lived happily for six more years, where it died of bovine tuberculosis. I've now arrived in Banff. Now, a legend of Banff is, um, there's a song that come from here known as McPherson's Rant. And this McPherson was the last man to be hanged within this area. James McPherson, who obviously his father was a McPherson, his mother was a gypsy. When James was growing up, he'd become a fiddle player and uh, a very famous fiddle player actually used to tour about in a band. When he got into his 20s, he, he was a robber. He was caught twice, but uh, escaped both times until eventually he was caught at uh, St. Rufus Fair in Keith. It was either August or September, uh, a day in one of those two months. Between two and three, he was uh, sentenced to be hanged by the neck for two criminal offences. The first, for being a robber, and also for bearing arms at a market, and second, because it was of gypsy origin. And in those days, if you were a traveller in Scotland, that was a criminal offence. This is back in the late 1600s. He was due to be hung between the hours of two and three, and the messenger was uh, arriving from Turriff. And to make sure that the pardon didn't arrive by the time he got hung, the gov before he got hung, the government officials moved the clock in Banff 15 minutes faster to reach three o'clock and therefore proceed with the execution. Before he, hung, before he was hanged, he was allowed to play his fiddle one more time and he played a tune, which is now known as McPherson's Rant. And before he was hung, after he played his tune, he offered his fiddle to the crowd, who 
would possibly remember him by. But because no one was brave enough to take it, they smashed it over his knee and threw it into the crowd, threw the pieces into the crowd. But there's also a version where uh, of the story which said he smashed it and then threw it into the pieces into his grave. Because of the government officials changed the time for 15 minutes faster, uh, they got into so much trouble, and because of that, the, the clock is now 15 minutes behind as a lesson to be learned. Across the water, uh, the clock tower in Macduff has got three sides to the clock. The west-facing side, which faces Banff, doesn't have a face. And therefore, the people in Macduff or the people at Banff couldn't look at the clock because there was no hands, so therefore they couldn't actually tell the time. So that is how the officials got away with it. A common thing with Scottish uh, legends and folklore is that it has a lot of water-based entities. For example, the Kelpies, there's the Nix, uh, which is an English one, but there are also things called the Brag and the Shelly Coat. The Shelly Coat, pretty much as it says, is a monster which looks like it has a coat full of shells and uh, it rattles when it walks. This is just the image that's been given. And what that does is, it would, it would go in the water and it would give a, a cry or a squeal or something like that to pretend it was drowning. And any suspecting uh, passing by would, uh, would jump in to try and save them. And when they get to it, uh, either the Shellacoat would take them in and drown them, or would just laugh at them, just for the sake of it. The other one, uh, the Brag, uh, which, uh, which is meant to be a goblin sort of idea. Again, normally seen around about uh, rivers, lakes, uh, lakes, locks, those sort of things. And it's a shapeshifter, and it normally chooses between a horse or a donkey. And uh, it would let people ride it, ride its back, and it would come to a body of water. And this against it, it would buck, send them into the water, and laugh at them. So pretty much an average day in Scotland. Let's be honest, it wouldn't be a Scottish Myths and Legends tour without coming here. Possibly Scotland's most famous legend, if you will, is Nessie, the Loch Ness Monster. I believe the origins of Nessie came about when someone had saw something bobbing in the water, weren't sure what it was. But after a while looking into it, they decided that it was a monster. Word spreads around, people come here to see if they can see the monster for themselves. Maybe even get a close-up. They say that Nessie is a monster, but considering that it lives in the water, or supposedly resides in, in the water, wouldn't that be classed as a sea serpent or a leviathan? One thing I'll say about Loch Ness itself is that it was formed by an iceberg during the Ice Age, and the gorge is 227 metres deep which is about double than the North Sea. I've just found a big stick. I'm gonna have to be extra careful. There's been a blizzard. Walking through the ruins of Uckert Castle, I found out something pretty interesting here, apart from how long it stood and also the, the fact it backs onto Loch Ness. But there was actually something I found called the Ghost of Uckert Castle, which was a lot of stone, uh, woodwork, everything like that. A lot of things had went missing, but not any old things. Lead. Ten tons of lead were stolen. 
Every time there was a big robbery, scholars were always confused because they didn't have any plans, there was no evidence left, they had nothing to go by. So eventually, after everything died down and went away, all that information was gone, so nobody knew where it went after that. You think if I throw it in, Nessie will come up and fetch it? When you do these kind of road trips, there are three things you need to make sure you have. Enough funding, enough supplies, and to make sure that if anyone else is living in the same household as you, they have a key to get in. Because I'm currently heading back. Just making sure I'm safe. If I find a brag or a shelly coach, I'm not going in after it.